Hello and welcome back to English 437 slash 537 with me, Dr. Matt Barton. Uh, today we'll, we, uh, we'll be covering the uh, chapters three, I believe, in these books. Uh, Show Some Skin by Amy Jo Martin, and then we'll get into uh, Carol's book where he's getting into the nitty-gritty of headlines and hyperlinks. It's going to be a lot of fun. A lot of uh, very practical information in both these chapters, but I think also a lot of uh, inspirational stuff, which I always love. Uh, so here's the objectives for this lecture. Uh, hopefully by the end of this, you'll be able to identify some strategies for achieving authenticity, or at least getting a little closer to it. Uh, also humanizing your brand, whether that be a brand company that you're working for or your own personal brand. Uh, we'll talk about effective headlines, deck heads, subheads, and lists, organizing content in layers, uh, expertly hyperlinking, and then converting large wads of text into digital friendly chunks. So all very worthy objectives. <laughs> I think this will be uh, well worth our time. Uh, all right, so I'd like to start with a question for you. Now, Martin here, we're starting with her, as usual. Uh, so she's urging, quote, uh, human connections with audiences in ways not possible by traditional branding. That's sort of her argument in favor of social media. Uh, and she says that traditional branding replies primarily on logos and catchphrases, taglines, and that sort of thing. Uh, whereas the people that are using social media effectively really come across as people uh, that we can relate to. Uh, so I've got some uh, Twitters here, some tweets and Twitter accounts uh, that have some kind of a photo or a video clip where I think that's this that's the goal of the uh, the tweet in question. They're trying these are celebrities trying to come across as being real humans, <laughs> humanizing their brands, uh, making them seem authentic as opposed to uh, some kind of canned message, uh, a talking point, uh, you know, something just for the corporate messaging behind it. Uh, they, they're trying to come across as people. At least I think that's the goal. Uh, so just, I've got three options here. You can pick either or any of these. I got Mike Rowe there from Dirty Jobs, uh, Beto O'Rourke uh, promoting uh, someone else's campaign. And then lastly, the author of our book, and she's got a photo there. Let's take a look, see, and just uh, come back and say, do you think this is authentic? Is it coming across as authentic anyway? Uh, or does it seem ineffective? Uh, so just quick, you know, what, what do you think and why or why not? All right, then, so moving on along, uh, she talks in this chapter about, quote, showing some skin. <laughs> Uh, what does she mean by that? Uh, it's probably not what you're thinking. Uh, she's just talking here about uh, authenticity, again, coming across as a person rather than just a corporate logo, a sort of faceless corporation. <laughs> uh, and we see evidence of this all over the place. She talked a little bit in here about Pepsi. And I forget, the like the Pepsi generation or something like that was the tagline when she wrote this book, I guess. I, I just went to Google, typed in Pepsi, and looked at what their current uh, marketing campaign looks like, and it doesn't seem all that different to me. It's you know you got the Pepsi here, we've got the uh, the new phrase I guess is or the new catchphrase that's what I like, sort of there, and you know that's I guess some people that might resonate with them, uh, they might identify with that, but it, to, just to me it doesn't seem like there's any kind of personality behind this. I'm not sure who the I there is. I guess that's me. <laughs> uh, you know, it seems just like the typical old traditional branding strategy to me anyway. Uh, so I agree with Martin. You know, she says people don't connect with the stuff like this. I don't know if they ever did, but certainly not anymore. Uh, they want to put a person, you know, with the phrase. Or they want to they want to connect with a person, a character, whether that be a CEO uh, some type of mascot, perhaps. Uh, but just that alone doesn't cut it anymore. And I like the way she puts this. So instead of asking, what's your brand? Uh, she instead asks people, who is your brand? It's a very different question. I, I like where she's uh, going with this. And then she's got a great example, or two examples here for us to compare and contrast. Uh, Good Goodell, I guess, from the NFL. And she talks about he was 
you know, basically like standard operating procedure for these big corporations, these big organizations. You know, he kept the, his Twitter very official, and there wasn't anything there that you couldn't find elsewhere. Everything was kind of just going through uh, the traditional media. And, you know, her argument was the NFL is big enough, it's been around long enough, it's venerable enough that that's okay. You know, it's not going to tank suddenly because there's no real personality behind him. <laughs> we don't really identify, we don't really know him, and we certainly don't like uh, support the NFL because of his personality. There's just not even a factor there. And then she compares that with, I think, Dana or Dana White of UFC, which I think I didn't write this down, but it's like Universal Fighting Championships, I think. I hope that's right. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I like the mixed martial arts, which uh, I agree with her. I'm really hearing a lot more about that. You know, if people, I get students all the time telling me about this. They're wearing the, the merchandise and, and they know who he is. Uh, White. It's it's clear that his personality is driving some of this. Uh, people feel like they can relate to him because he comes across, and I guess, more, you might hate him, <laughs> but you feel like at least you know who he is. Uh, right, whereas the, the Goodell, or Goodell, we don't really have any, I don't even know how to pronounce the guy's name. <laughs> just don't have any sense of him as a person. Uh, so whether that's good or bad or irrelevant, I guess he would probably say it's irrelevant, doesn't really matter. Uh, whereas White has come to believe that it's really the key thing. So he is who he is. So here's White talking about, or here's, I'm sorry, uh, Martin says that White... Uh, the UFC guy is incapable of faking anything, is it, which is a, quote, perfect recipe for social media success if, <laughs> if your audience values what you bring to the table. So I'm glad she put in that uh, bit that I've uh, emphasized there. Uh, so you may have heard of Jesse Ventura. Uh, he was the governor of our state for a while, and he's, he still gets around the social media. I don't know if he does Twitter, uh, but you see him making the rounds uh, sometimes on the talk shows. And, and I would put him in this category as well. Uh, you know, he's you don't get the sense, at least I don't get the sense, that he's just putting on a show, uh, that he's trying to be something he's not. Uh, you you kind of think instead maybe he's incapable of being anything else, right? And, <laughs> you know, I won't mention certain other uh, folks that would seem to fall into this category. Uh, so you could say, well, why isn't that? I guess it worked. He got to be the governor. I think that was even before social media was a thing. I don't know if he's run for anything uh, since then. Uh, but I think he's a pretty good example of this phenomenon. So if you if you like the message that he's selling, you know, if you like his, if you like him, or you feel like you know him, then you might be more loyal to his brand or whatever product he's endorsing or if he's running for something his campaign uh, whereas if you don't value that you know of course it won't work on you and so it's not this it's not that it's going to work every time with every audience uh, but it's going to depend a lot I guess uh, even if it does come across as authentic and that he's not putting on an act or a show uh, there's still that important piece of having to agree <laughs> with, the, with the values <laughs> okay uh, and then moving on to communicating vicariously, I thought this was a point worth dwelling on a little bit. Uh, so Martin says it's not, I think uh, White at one point was literally just answering the phone. I think he slipped and leaked out his private office phone at some point. He's getting thousands of calls and he's actually trying to accept all those calls. It seemed like a absolute hellscape <laughs> to, uh, to me, uh, but that's what he was doing. Uh, she says you don't really have to talk to every fan. You know, you get if you're big enough, you're getting these tweets, you're getting all these comments on YouTube or whatever. And she says it's not really the key thing that you have to respond to every single person, because there's this sort of vicarious aspect to it, where the fans they're happy enough just to see other fans, other people like them, getting to engage directly with the celebrity. Uh, so for fun, I pulled uh, Burger King's Twitter feed. And Burger King is kind of an interesting case. To me, it's just fascinating, really, rhetorically speaking. Like, what's going on here with, uh, you know, this? They, I guess it's a mascot, the king or whoever, that they're trying to humanize in somewhat strange ways. Uh, but if you look at this Twitter post or this tweet here uh, that I have uh, here, you can see that whoever is on the other end of this thing, 
is communicating like a person. They say, sorry, I was in the shower, LOL. And they're uh, responding to this one, probably one of however many thousands of uh, tweets that Burger King gets on a daily basis. But, you know, all the other people doing this, they see Peyton here having some luck. Peyton got sort of called out or shouted out by Burger King, included in this. And that's kind of a thrill. Uh, even if you're not Peyton, you, you kind of like this to some extent. It kind of adds a little fuel, uh, keeps the conversation going, keeps people trying. So I think that's sort of what she's got in mind here. And then she gives us some really great insights. Again, I like to emphasize these. Uh, so the first one is letting the connections and conversations serve as your advertisements because they are. So the little thing we just looked at with Burger King, I think Martin would say that's an advertisement. It's a really effective advertisement. It's a connection to somebody, not just to Peyton, but again, all those other fans tweeting, anybody who sees that, all of Peyton's friends, etc. Anybody following uh, that Twitter account. Uh, so that's the great, that's basically what I would call something like word of mouth, right? People feel a connection to the company either directly or through uh, somebody they're following. Uh, and I think that's why you probably see these things happening like Burger King and I remember Wendy's. Wendy's kind of has its highs and lows, I suppose, but uh, they, they do a similar thing with their ad campaigns and their social media. They try to put a little personality behind it so it doesn't just seem like this, you know, an anonymous, faceless corporation. Uh, there's some pretty weird stuff going on from a post-modern uh, perspective. But anyway, I agree with her on that. Uh, she also says it's not about gaining attention, but keeping the attention. I think that's another key insight. You know, there used to be this idea of the publicity stunt. And you go out and you do something crazy, you get a lot of attention, but then it quickly goes away, and nobody's really following you after that. It's about the keeping of the attention. And I think they're about the reality TV shows. You know, there's so many of them now, I can't even keep track of them all. But, you know, those shows are part of their appeal, I think, is it's like it's, it's going beyond, it's like giving you this glimpse inside who these people really are. You know, I think there was one about Ozzy. Was it the Osbournes, I think, was one of the early ones? But, I mean, there's been so many of these. Uh, but people keep tuning into this, right, because they want to see, like, what's happening next. They kind of feel a connection to the folks in these reality TV shows that they just didn't, I mean, people, I remember with uh, Friends when I was a kid, it's like Friends, people were really into that. Uh, but it's, I don't know if they necessarily felt the same level of connection uh, that they would to something like, oh, what's what's, what's some of these uh, modern uh, <laughs> reality TV shows? Can't even think, think of one off the top of my head. I think Duck Dynasty, but I think that's off the air already. So I guess the shows don't last forever. Uh, but people tune into those and feel a certain connection to the characters that they just didn't feel when they know it's just an actor playing a role. Uh, and then here's a good good line, too. She, just says, uh, she says, I don't recommend the full Monty on social media, which will almost always do more harm than good. So she's, she's kind of had a little fun there because her title is Show Some Skin. You know, ha ha. <laughs> uh, don't follow the examples of certain uh, politicians and reveal too much, right? Uh, but it's not about spilling your guts and feeling like you have to, you know, uh, show your worst sides because it's what you happen to be going through at the moment. It's just, it's not really the goal there. That's just going to freak people out. So I would, you probably are like me, we call this like the TMI, <laughs> the too much information <laughs> or foot and mouth disease, you know, that sort of thing. You know, you don't want to be saying things that are just going to, uh, well, I guess you have to kind of walk a line between what would be something that would be appropriate that would make me seem more authentic. And I don't want to, you know, sugarcoat everything about how I'm feeling. But, you know, on the other hand, you could certainly go too far with that and get into all kinds of uh, trouble. Not to mention just turning people off. <laughs> uh, okay, so question two. So think about your social media project, pitches you're making. Uh, if you're joining another project, think about that target audience. Again, think about who they who they are, what are their values, you know, the people that you want to reach, and then how might you show some skin, quote unquote, in a way that helps humanize your connections without coming across as distant 
or inauthentic or TMI or oversharing or just being manipulative. So, so ponder on that. Maybe scan back through the uh, Martin book a little bit and then we'll continue on. All right, now we're into the Carol book. And I really thought this was a great chapter. It's one of those things I felt like I could read several times and be picking up new tips along the way. You know, I really like both these books. I, th I feel like we're getting a really good uh, authorities on these topics, very experienced uh, voices. So I really try to uh, you know, perk up and pay attention to those. Uh, so here he's talking about how to write an effective headline. So that could be for a newspaper, but it could also be just as easily valid, valid for a block. So the first one is kind of what most people think about, yes, the headline should attract attention. That's why it's big, right, in the newspaper. They want you to look at it. They want you to get curious about it, right? So that's the first goal. But it doesn't stop there. There's actually several more characteristics. Now, one, it needs to summarize the message. So you should be able just to glance at the headline and get a pretty good feel for what that article is about. If you ever read the Harry Potter series, you know, there's this one of my favorite parts of the book for, for weird reasons, I don't know, is where he's just, he's kind of afraid that something's going to happen. I won't spoil it for you. Uh, so he's always looking at the newspapers and just browsing the headlines. Uh, and that's kind of applies to this idea. You know, he doesn't need to read the full story. He just wants to read the headline and from there decide if uh, the thing that he thinks is going to happen is going to happen. Uh, three, organize and give the content visual identity. You know, basically just a way to make it look neat. Uh, let you separate out different articles that might be on that page, different topics. Uh, three, help the reader to index that content. So kind of like what Harry was doing. Is it important? Is it relevant to me? Uh, is it not relevant? Does it not apply? Depicting the mood and the tone, right? Is this something terrifying? Is it exciting? Is it good news? Is it tragic news? And then just providing typographic relief. Uh, so your eyes, I guess, get kind of bored, or you get kind of bored just looking at the same kind of text, same size, same font. And so breaking that up a little bit can, you know, relieve some of that tension, re-engage you. All right, so keeping it simple, keeping it plain. Now he... I know we have a lot of creative uh, writing uh, folks in this class, a lot of uh, poets, and uh, maybe some comedians as well, or people that just love puns uh, like I do. Uh, but he says, don't kind of avoid that temptation. You don't want to try to get poetic with the headline. You don't want to be dazzling or punny, I suppose. Uh, mostly, there's several reasons. One being, you don't know how the person's going to respond to it. They might not get the joke. Uh, but it could actually lead people to stray. Besides that, he says, that usually at best, it comes across as cute, and it's a lot funnier in your mind or in your head than it is as a headline. So the advice is just focus on informing and summarizing. And he's got an example here where he, uh, you know, the, the, he says that there's could be even not intentional, not intentionally, but if you're not careful, you can even... Uh, imply some sexual innuendo <laughs> so, uh, or unintentional dirty jokes basically uh, so the, this one is researcher prefers the company of mountain sheep uh, <laughs> uh, so yeah don't do that uh, and then moving into this headlines and deck heads so he's got his example I pulled one he talked about the New Yorker so also went to the New Yorker and I was looking at some of their recent articles that are currently on the site. And I found this one. So let's see. the deck, we got the headline there is, The Still Astonishing, quote, Just Another Girl on the IRT, unquote. Uh, so that's our headline. And then below that we have the deck head or the drop head, which is just going to give us a little more information to uh, follow up this headline, right? So you read the headline and then you move beyond it under it and it says the film presents an outward view of the inner life of a young black woman of a person who by the fact of those three descriptors is subjected to relations of power and control so hopefully you're able to see here how we move from the headline into this drop head 
or deck head. And it's just like that sort of pyramid that we'll talk about in a minute, right? We go from, uh, it's all relevant information. It all leads into each other, getting a little more as specific as we go along. And then we talk about subheads. So if you have an article or a blog post, if it's going to be over 350 words, if it's less than that, you don't need a subhead. Uh, if it's over that, though, you can use the subheads to break it up. And this is an article from uh, another one from Wired. And I just pulled one of the subheads, but this is a big, long article. And then there's several of these points like this where they break off into a subheading. And this one is just simply David L. Craddock on Diablo 3 colon. And there's several more subheads like this. David L. Craddock on blah, blah, blah. David L. Craddock on this, on that. Uh, so they break up the article that way. Uh, maybe not the most graceful thing in the world, but, you know, it does. It sort of serves two purposes. One, it helps you to stay organized as a reader. And two, you can scan up and down the article and just read the bits. Maybe you don't care about what Craddock says about World of Warcraft. Uh, you just want to read what he says about Diablo 3. Uh, so this kind of structure would let you, you do that easily. All right, so here's some tips on good headlines. So use present tense. Heath Ledger dies. Now, that's a good headline. I think he gave another example that was something like dead in bed was the headline. It's just, just kind of strange. Uh, but yeah, stick to the present tense. Even if it's something that happened before the headline or before the uh, report, you still put it in present tense because it is kind of, it is news. You know, it's sort of, it is news in the present uh, so that, therefore, you use the present tense. Omit the articles such as the or a or an. So you wouldn't say the Yankee pitcher. You just say Yankee, pic uh, Yankee pitcher. Uh, omit present tense forms of the verb to be. So you wouldn't say Stephen Curry is named most valuable player. You don't need that is in there. You just say Stephen Curry named most valuable player. Replace the uh, verb will with the verb to. So sales, class, uh, sales tax to increase in June, not sales tax will increase in June. Saves one letter. <laughs> uh, replace and with a, either with a comma or a semicolon. So this is a little bit harder to tell when to do what, or uh, when to do which, but we see Tar Hills destroyed Duke advanced to title game. So in that case, you just use the comma. And the second one, we say Browns finish in last place, semicolon, coach's contract not renewed. So you say, why does that one have a semicolon? This one has a comma. It's because the one with a semicolon, these are basically two complete sentences or thoughts or independent clauses. So you could say Browns finish in last place. You know, that could be a headline. Or coach's contract not renewed. You know, that could be a headline. Uh, but if you look at the first one, uh, advanced to title game, you know, that's not a headline, right? There's not enough there. It's just a little, uh, you know, it needs that first bit uh, for it to work. So you just use the comma there. And then a few other ones. So using numerals, so just 120 instead of writing out 120. Uh, omit uh, in punctuation unless it's a question. So I did find an example of this. They're, they seem to be rare. I went to Google News and looked through all the headlines. I had to go quite a ways before I found one that actually had a question mark in it. Uh, but here is here it is from USA Today. Lunar New Year 2020 colon. What are the traditions and which Asian cultures celebrate it? Question mark. And then Carol says attribution is important, even if even if it is just a headline. And there's his example, Trump colon tax reform on the way. So that lets you know who is saying it. And then using single quote marks. So here's one I pulled this morning. Uh, so the idea is if you're quoting somebody within the headline, you don't need to use double quotes. You just use a single quote. And I like this example because it kind of relates to the previous one as well. So Trump on Yovanovitch ouster, colon, and then single quote, I have a right to hire and fire ambassadors, single quote. 
All right, and then we have the poll quote. And you see these in a lot of uh, journal, academic journals, they even use these. Uh, but you can see them all the time in magazines. And occasionally you do see these online uh, and blogs. And WordPress will let you do this. So you've got something that you want to draw attention to, a particular passage, a great quote, uh, just something that will... I kind of think about it almost as the role of a, an illustration. If you're reading a book, sometimes it might be a picture there to kind of uh, provide some visual interest. Uh, so this is a similar concept. You're kind of uh, making a graphic out of some of the text in the piece. So there's the example. I'm going to read all this. But if you look over here, you can see the the pull quote. It's got kind of a, what are these, quotation mark graphic. It's sort of a... Uh, what do you call it? A watermark <laughs> in the back. Uh, but they basically they, they bump up the font, they put it in italics, they kind of make it look nice. And it's just kind of off to the side there. And it's kind of nice when you're flipping through a book, you can see these and read that. And maybe that gives you some sense of what this page is about. Uh, then we move into the power of lists. He says, smartphone users have a seemingly insatiable appetite for lists. And I'll give you 10 reasons. <laughs> all right, we see these, I call them clickbait. You see it all the time, the top 10 this, the top 10 that, seven, seven of this, six of that. And so I'm not, I, don't, I want to uh, challenge you to talk about this one. So here's the third question for you today. So he mentions BuzzFeed. Uh, for good reason. I mean, BuzzFeed's always doing this. It's always list of this, list of that. I uh, said, so just go to BuzzFeed. I have a link there for you. Uh, visit the site. Uh, scroll up and down till you find one of their lists. And then answer these questions. So is that list consistent in terms of structure and style? So do all the items match up nicely? Uh, two, is it well set up? Does the site, BuzzFeed, clearly signal the purpose of that list? And then three, is it brief? So how many items are on it? He says six is the sweet spot. Uh, you, you know, see what you think. Is that list too long? Do you feel like they should cut a few items, get it back down to six? Uh, what do you think? All right, so moving on then to hyperlinks. And he starts off by saying hyperlinks aren't as distracting as originally thought. So I guess at some point, English professors, I mean, why do these English professors, why do they keep giving this information? Uh, they kept saying, don't put a link in there. It's too distracting. People will see that blue bit and they, uh, you know, just totally make them lose their focus. Uh, Carol says they've actually done some research on this now and they have found it doesn't matter. It's, it's fine. <laughs> it, that The fact that there's a blue word in there is not going to make somebody stop reading. Uh, it's not like, oh, there's a squirrel, you know. Oh, there's a hyperlink. So that's the good news. But don't go crazy just yet because there are two problems. One is that that link could go bad. This is hap happens to me so many times. You know, you, you, you write a blog post, you write a, a book, and you want to include a link in the book or whatever it is. And then by the time, you don't know how long it's going to be. That Somebody could be looking at this article weeks or months or even years or even decades later. And then suddenly that link doesn't work. So whatever that information was, if it was vital, they can't get to it anymore. And so that's a problem. And it's not just that, but it makes you look bad. makes it look like, well, you didn't really check this link too well. Uh, so basically you have to go through occasionally, check all the links, make sure everything's working, uh, which is tedious. So that could be a problem. Uh, two, a reader clicking on a link may not return. You know, maybe you link to something, uh, they click on that and they start reading that article and then don't ever come back to your article. Uh, so those are two challenges. You know, again, he says it's not as big of a deal as you might think. A lot of people will come back. Uh, but it is just something to think about. You know, the he, he talks about this a little bit later, the... Now, the idea used to be, well, you wouldn't want to link to somebody else's blog because that's just providing free advertisement for that other blog, the competition, basically. Uh, but he's, as we'll get to later, doesn't really work that way. So why would you 
why would you put a link in your blog? And he's got what, five reasons here. One would be that you uh, direct to direct their attention to the, <laughs> obviously, <laughs> you know, you're, you're not just providing that link for fun, right? You want to direct them to the information there. Uh, so that's probably the most common thing. Uh, two is a way to basically cite your sources. So you could, if you're reading a, a survey or a Pew or like he does the pointer, some pointer research from the Pointer Institute, you could just put the citation according to the Pew research, blah, 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 and just have that be the link. And then you move on. And basically that is, that is the functional equivalent of a citation in, in regular print. Uh, three, providing the context, right? A lot of times you might, especially with Twitter, you're not going to go on for a paragraph on Twitter explaining what this is about. Uh, you just direct people to this link that explains it, and then they, uh, in case they're not aware of, like, what are you talking about? <laughs> uh, they can read up on that. If they don't need it, that's fine. Then they'll get the, they'll get what you're tweeting and move on. Uh, let's see. Enticing and rewarding readers with something more. You know, people like this, three other places you might look, or here, now that you've read this, you can go to this page and look at that, whatever. Uh, by now, now that you've seen the vi my video, now you can click on this behind the scenes video. Uh, fifth, offer interactivity and a personalized experience, right? Because people, I think, quite rightly feel like this is a, uh, even if it's something on Kindle, right? I, I'm reading a Kindle book and I kind of want to see a link there. I want to be interacting with it in ways I can't interact with a regular book. I kind of feel like I paid some money for this Kindle. <laughs> I paid probably just as much for this Kindle version as I would for the printed version. I kind of want some way to interact with that beyond just reading it. And uh, hyperlinks would be a good way to do that. Uh, let's see, hyperlink conventions. So I'm sure, again, this is, I'm sure you have seen hyperlinks before. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm not going to go deeply into this, but just a few quick things. Uh, you know, they talk about the size of them being consistent, uh, or the links shouldn't all be different sizes. Uh, differentiated from the text, so you want to be able to tell, like, what's a hyperlink and what's not. Uh, intuitiveness. So I shouldn't have to think too hard about, is that a link? Is that not a link? <laughs> What's going to happen? Clarity. So I don't know, like, what am I going to get into if I click this? Why did you post it? Or why did you link to this thing? And then Goodwill. And there used to be a little gag called Rick Rolling. If you uh, remember that from a few years back. And it was funny for a little while, but, you know, people that got Rick Rolled, I think it was Rick Ashley, video that it would take you to if you click the link. It looked like it'd be some link to uh, some kind of information you needed. And then it would just be uh, that Rick Astley music video. So yeah, good gag, good, good prank, but uh, it doesn't take too long for that to get very old. You know, especially if you're just linking back to some kind of advertisement, some eBay referral scheme, uh, whatever. Uh, people will just not click your links anymore. Now, just as far as making the link itself, he says that the click here, if you just say click here to go to this blog, something like that, he says that's basically like a headline in print that says important story below. <laughs> Imagine that head headline, uh, important story below. It's ridiculous, right? So he gives some, some good examples in his book. I came up with my own. Uh, so bad example. For more information about hyperlinking, click here. So I've got click here, underline, that's the link. So what he recommends, and I agree, would be just to say something like this instead. Read Dr. Barton's hyperlinking guide. So instead of saying click here, uh, I've got what it is, hyperlinking guide. So you know somebody sees, sees hyperlinking guide, it's clear like, what do you think this links to? My guess is a hyperlinking guide, right? <laughs> it's very clear. You don't feel like, uh, now I guess, you know, if this was a, a crappy resource, you might not trust the links anymore. Uh, but I think it matches all of our parameters there. So questions to ask when hyperlinking. 
One, how can I assure and orient readers when they first arrive on or at the page? So especially if this is a big page that you're sending them to, uh, they might get kind of bewildered, bewildered or overwhelmed when they get to that page. So is there some way I can set it up better so that they'll know what they're getting, getting into? Uh, two, how can I help them to read efficiently and with pleasure? So again, with the you don't want to keep taking them off to all these other sites and reading this and that. You know, is there some way you can sort of help them to navigate this information? Uh, three, how can I help readers to retrace the steps they have taken in their reading paths or to return to any one step or level in any of those paths? Now, this is where it really just starts to get tricky. Um, you know, I, I think points two and three here make sense in, in terms of a, a Kindle book. You know, I was noticing when I'm reading a book like uh, Carol's book on my Kindle, it's nice when I can, if I'm if I want to go back and look at the first part of a chapter, I click on the table of contents and then link right to that chapter. Uh, or maybe there is a way I can get to a specific section. And so that makes that a lot easier. But the problem is, you know, once I've gone on to the table of contents, how do I get back, you know, to that place I was before I left? And the Kindle will let me do that. It'll say, would you like to return now to the, you know, page you're on before? Uh, so that's built into a Kindle. Uh, but to some extent, you could do that with a, an article or a blog. You could, you could provide, you know, at the end of the thing you wanted them to look at, you know, either a back button or bring them back to that section of the article uh, where they encountered that link. You know, we'll talk a little bit more about how to do that in a second. But the point is just to be thinking about this. Are they going to get lost and unable to get back? You know, one of the most annoying things to me is when you're doing a form online, and you, uh, you click a link within the form to go get some more information. You know, sometimes they'll say, do you need help with this item on the form? And there'll be a link. You click the link, and you read the information, and then you say, okay, and then when you, you come back, all your stuff is gone. You have to re-input all the stuff into the form. <laughs> and I guarantee you that is annoying. Uh, so you would definitely want to make sure that when they did uh, get back to that page, uh, it wouldn't just wipe out their information. Uh, how can I describe or signal the destinations for the links in the document? So again, would not just click here, you know, but what is where where are you sending them? Is it a website? Is it what kind of website is it? Is it a newspaper site? You know, that should be uh, made clear. All right, so now another time for another question. So choose an article. You can go to the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal's websites, or you can go to another newspaper site. I don't care. Uh, just uh, what I want you to do is look at the links that they're using in their articles and then answer these questions. So how well do the, does it do this? Does that try to get an article with lots of links? So does it assure and orient the readers when they first arrive on or at the page? Does it help them to read efficiently and with pleasure? Uh, does it help readers retrace the steps they have taken or to return to any one step? And then finally, does it describe or signal the destinations for the links in the document. Let's take a few minutes to do that and then come back and we'll continue. Here's a little section about hyperlinking hygiene. And I put a, he's got a quotation here from Jeff Jarvis. I think he said it was a journalism professor. Link unto others, link unto others good stuff as you would have them link unto your good stuff. So that's obviously a paraphrase there of the uh, golden rule. Um, but it's getting at this idea of the bloggers using the links to make social connections. And I told you before, there used to be this fear like, well, you wouldn't want to link to this other site because that's the competition. Uh, but what they found is actually that's not true. It's good to be linking to other people's blogs. Uh, if somebody links to your blog, you'll be a lot more likely to link to their blog. You know, and you're kind of mutually benefiting uh, from this. You know, there's certainly other YouTubers that do similar stuff to what I do. Uh, I don't hate them. <laughs> you know, if they do something cool, I mention it on my channel. You know, and direct people to go look at that episode or whatever it is. And likewise, and you see this on other channels. Uh, and I've done this too. Sometimes I'll be a guest on their show. 
Uh, there'll be a guest on mine. Uh, you know, this is just kind of small time here, but you see it all over the place. And I put a link here to her screenshot from Game Banshee, who, by the way, this is a site about role-playing games, and it's based, the editor is based in uh, the Twin Cities. Now, so if you ever, ever uh, want to do some interns, if you want to be an intern for a real uh, commercial site uh, about role-playing games, we could try to uh, set that up for you. I think his name is, uh, I'm pretty sure his name is John. Uh, but you can see that he has, or who, who wrote this? Val H., uh, one of the staff, looks like. They're writing, a, this is a blog here, but they're writing about some other blog, uh, the Battle Brothers Developer Blog 124. So you can see when we dig in there, you see they have a, uh, a little bit about what this is, and then they have a link to the blog. And then they go on about what would you see if you went to that link. Uh, so it works out pretty well. You know, it's good for this uh, blazing desert, or overhyped studios benefits, and also game banshee benefits. And then we have a whole bunch of tips here about scan ability. You know, I'm not going to go through all of these uh, in any detail. You can look certainly look at the book if you like. Uh, but when you're designing your blog, you're setting it up, you're thinking about how everything is going to look, uh, you can think about these factors, right, and how they might contribute to uh, making your uh, blog easy to navigate. So if I go to your blog, and I, sh I should be able to get to the articles I'm looking for. I should be able to tell the articles apart and so on. And we have a whole bunch of tools to, I've listed here. Everything from a highlighted keyword on down to variations in color and font, uh, the subheads, the bulleted lists, uh, how you present this information, and of course, uh, brevity. And then he talks a lot about, or towards the end of the chapter, we've got lots of examples here, and I encourage you to visit the links to those. I know he's got screenshots, but it's not the same. Uh, but I pulled just the first one here for you. Uh, so the idea here is instead of just using text, they're sort of bringing in all these different multimedia tools to tell this story. And the idea is that each one of these tools, whether it's a photograph, a satellite map, or a video, is a layer. And they're giving the interactors a quote, or this is the argument anyway. Uh, he says all this, quote, gives its interactors an immersive reliving of Gray's last conscious moments. Uh, so take a look. I put a link there for you. So just take a look. You know, let's click through this thing, and then uh, come back and tell me do you, what do you think? Do you think this zeroes in? Do you think it's a well-layered presentation? Uh, is is it more immersive than other types of uh, uh, social media? What if it was just a series of photographs, or what if it was just text? Do you like this better? All right, so a couple last things here. Uh, he, he mentions the pointer research findings, and this this kind of stuff here to me is where the real gold is in a book like this because we're moving beyond just like, uh, oh, I don't know, anecdotal evidence and like, well, this works or this is, uh, you know, or this makes sense logically. Are we getting beyond that kind of argument into like, what does actual scientific research tell us <laughs> actually happens? Is what we find so many times is what people think they're doing or what people tell you they're doing is not what they're actually doing. And this is where I get a lot of my, I tell students this stuff all the time, uh, th this information here about the pointer uh, research. So a lot of it has to do with the eye tracking software and the tools. They, they have little cameras and they can look at your eyeballs <laughs> and like see exactly where these folks are looking on the pages, on the websites. And this is where they found a lot of stuff about reading, too, and literacy. But everybody thinks that you start up here and you go left and you go to the right and then left and right. Whereas, really, it's always this weird, like, F pattern. So people are, like, up here for a while, then they come over here and then skip down, like, a, the letter F. Uh, so that's kind of strange, you know, but it's something that's really helpful. You know, if you know this, you can start planning your layouts with that in mind. Uh, text is more, this is something, again, counterintuitive to me. Text is more attention grabbing than an image or a, a big headline. So the problem with the headlines is they get big enough 
And your brain just kind of interprets that as just a picture, just artwork. You don't actually read it. But the text, you will. Uh, that's kind of bizarre. I remember another part of this uh, chapter, he was saying that it's, it's best with, if the headline is the same size as the deck, deck head. You know, usually the deck heads are smaller. Uh, but he says if they're the same size and they're smaller, then people will be more likely to read both. Uh, whereas if that one is smaller, it'll get ignored. So a lot of uh, just really intriguing stuff here. See, navigation is best at the top of the home page, not on the side or the bottom. So I think that's one of the options you have when you set up your Word, your WordPress blog. You can tell it you want your buttons across the top, or do you want them up, you know, on the side? Now, I don't know anybody puts them on the bottom, but I guess some people <laughs> do that. Uh, but people will uh, default to looking for it at the top. Uh, shorter paragraphs twice as likely to be read. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I feel like that's true, just kind of on a gut level. And then the mug shots or the head shots are just mostly ignored. And again, Carol's coming to this from a newspaper perspective, and these a lot of the remember I think even the Saint Cloud Times. I don't know if they still do this, but you know they always have a little picture of the reporter, like off in the corner somewhere, like by their byline. And, you know, I think it's kind of cool. I like to see the reporter. You know, I can kind of remind, like, this is a real person. <laughs> but he says it's kind of useless. People, nobody looks at it anyway. And then he follows this up with some research on iPads. And really, I think this is something, if, you know, if you really got an eye towards the future, if you want to be a little bit ahead of the curve... Uh, the more you can focus in on the iPads, the Kindles, these devices, you know, there's a whole lot of people that are buying these things, reading all kinds of stuff. People are making a lot of money. Uh, but there's it's early enough to where there's not a whole lot of really settled conventions. You know, there's a lot of room left uh, for innovation. And, you know, if you got some skills in this, if, like if you really know how to design a wham-bam uh, a Kindle book or make a really good document uh, for an iPad, I mean, you're in a very small category. <laughs> you know, there's not that much competition out there. And the potential, potential revenue is incredible. And so I really think it's worth, even if you don't like iPads, you don't like Kindles, whatever, you just wanted the book. Uh, you know, see if you can get beyond that because there might be some lucrative opportunities here. And it's not so far beyond your skill sets, you wouldn't be able to do it. Uh, but anyway, to the iPad. And so several points here about these. So probably the first is the most obvious. People are touching the pad, right? Now you, you touch the Kindle. Uh, you don't press buttons off to the side. Uh, people kind of got their hands on this thing. In some ways, it's like the old newspapers. If you watch somebody read a newspaper, it's a very tactile, tactile uh, experience. And so that's something to design for. Uh, people like touching, tapping, pinching, <laughs> moving stuff. Uh, that's part of the, the thrill of this, why people get an iPad instead of just a laptop. Uh, another insight, people generally stop reading after about 78 seconds. So this is kind of fun. You know, this is another good example here, too, of like the 78 seconds. This is that big data, uh, the big metrics. Like, how would you know, know that before? With newspapers, you, you, it'd be very hard to tell this kind of information. Uh, but now we have these strategies for seeing, like, well, people click off or they, they scooch it or something after about that long. Uh, three, people like the landscape mode. That kind of surprised me. You know, my Kindle, I have it just in portrait mode, I suppose. Uh, but maybe I'm kind of weird. I guess most people like this landscape mode better. You know, certainly if you're doing watching a movie, obviously, you want it like this, but... Apparently, even if you're reading a book or a newspaper, uh, people want it like that. Let's see. Ignore the custom navigation schemes. Oh, my God. <laughs> Please. I, I, this, this drives me insane. It's one reason I don't like uh, even some of the books. I, uh, you know, I love, I love the e-books. I like these uh, websites, the e-texts and all, uh, for many reasons. But one thing that drives me just bonkers it's when they they try to come up with their own like way to navigate, and it's you know it's always clunky and it's just so much better if they just let let me do it. You know I'd much rather just have a PDF 
uh, I can click through. You know, I know how to do a PDF. Uh, you know, a lot of times, uh, for, for whatever reason, these textbook publishers feel like they have to roll their own <laughs> instead of just making it a Kindle book uh, or making it a PDF or something everybody's familiar with. They have to do their own clunky thing, you know, and half the time. It's like, well, I can't even go back. Uh, I can't just use the back button anymore. I have to, like, click on a weird box somewhere. So I, I really, I despise that. I don't want a custom navigation scheme. You know, I remember, I think it was back in the two, early 2000s. Uh, I don't remember when this was, but there was this phase that I thought it was going to be the apocalypse soon because every freaking site was some kind of flash-based thing, and it, it's like they you know, they try to make it look like a magazine, and you'd have to, like, hold the button and, like, drag it, and you could see, like, the page go by, and there would be this animated stuff everywhere, and freaking uh, music playing and all this and I'm like I, just, I don't want this <laughs> you know, I just want a regular old page and uh, before that there was this weird thing with these uh, windows like everything was in a box like it's like a computer screen with all the little windows you could move around and close and expand and frames I think they called that and again I just couldn't wait for that to people to get tired of that and move on <laughs> uh, thankfully they did uh, but nobody wants there's a really good book you know, I, I thought about assigning it for this class, uh, but it's Steve Krug, and it's called Don't Make Me Think. And that's basically his argument in that is, you know, people go to the website to read your article. They should be there to, you, you know, they shouldn't have to think too hard about how to find that article <laughs> and how to read through it and go to the next part and so on. Uh, if your interface is such where you really have to like, okay, let me figure this out. Where am I supposed to click? How do I go back? How do I search? Uh, that's just poor design in Krug's point of view. doesn't matter how beautiful it is, how nice it looks, how supposedly innovative it is. Uh, if people have to think too much about it, uh, they'll just move on to another site, and quite rightfully so. Uh, 